so now we're going to move on to Dr. John Messina's presentation. He's been working at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic response in Zambia um, and has created a presentation for us just to give us more information about the challenges, the experiences that they've had as clinicians and lessons learned. I'll give uh, the COVID-19 uh, Zambia's response plan and challenges that we've been facing uh, along the, the pandemic as we can recall. And um, uh, I'll try to give my uh, the presentation in the following outline. I'll just give the country profile. Uh, I'll give the health system uh, profile as well, the statistics, uh, the country response uh, in terms of the IMS structure. And then I'll give a uh, few highlights in terms of the challenges. And then I'll give the uh, experiences of creation to the, the pandemic uh, that we have experienced on. And then I'll try to share a little bit of uh, uh, lessons that we've learned as uh, the pandemic. So, uh, Zambia is actually a low middle income country uh, with a square rate of about 750. We have a population of uh, uh, just close to 18 million. We, we have 10 provinces with uh, 117 districts. And our population is actually divided into uh, rural, about 56% and 44% which is urban. We do have uh, around 2,900 uh, 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 And this is the map that shows the different uh, cases that we have. Uh, most of the cases are in the northern part of London, which is the China province. All right. Okay. So in terms of the health uh, system profile, we we are standing at uh, about one uh, one hospital to about two thousand uh, uh, population, and we have a doctor uh, population ratio of about one to two thousand, which is about five to ten thousand. Uh, nurses we are standing at about one to two thousand and five. We've got seventy seven uh, 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 IQ bits uh, available around the country. We have. Um, EMS systems that are uh, fairly poorly established, uh, though we do have EMS systems in terms of uh, not the conversion of EMS, but uh, some of the traditional EMS and transport systems that we have. We do have uh, some that are not uh, provided by the private sector, mostly in the copper gold towns, particularly in Rola, and then we also have uh, private uh, EMS systems uh, we try to imagine. Uh, the uh, paramedical out of hospital kind of care of patients, but um, I think you know, it does make us concerned. And then we do, in terms of the COVID-19 statistics, we are standing as of the 23rd of uh, July, we're standing at 1,420 cases. We've done a total of uh, 46,500 uh, tests so far, and we we have a death toll of 18 as of uh, 23rd. And with the testing capacity standing at one in uh, every particular case of uh, what we've done, and the map again is just showing the various uh, regions of the country and uh, the various uh, numbers. Again, you can see in northern part of London, the one that is located more about uh, 100 cases in Indonesia. And we're going to share how we try to strategy in terms of uh, the response. So, Zambia has used a three-armed approach to the, to the response. Uh, for the first one, we looked at the high level of surveillance with the uh, IMS structure, which I'm going to share just now. And then we do have the second, which is the case management and what can we uh, And then we also look at the community control and the management of the community as well. Uh, so in terms of the surveillance and the uh, IMS structure, so we do have a well-established uh, uh, case management and IMS structure. So I'm um, actually speaking somewhere around here, which is in the case management and on this uh, level of our uh, information. When we started in the in, in the early stages of the of the pandemic, I think I was first uh, prone to to the management was to look at the surveillance and the heightened uh, uh, test test uh, screening. So in February we embarked on uh, screening at the international airport. Uh, screening of all truck drivers at my crossing. As you know, Zambia is a, uh, is a land, uh, approachable country and also air. We don't have any, uh, any sea outlet. So most of the, we closed the international airport early, quite early, even before we recorded the, the first case. 
So our first case was actually recorded through the international airport at uh, Kenneth Town International Airport. Uh, that was in March 18. So we closed uh, borders. Uh, so, so February we we embarked mostly on um, on screening, testing, and case finding. Uh, in March, when we started having cases. Uh, we now started, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the other phone, which was now the case management where we identified the, the isolation centers. So in uh, March, April, we started reopening the borders, uh, and then we started doing targeted, uh, mass screening and testing in high, uh, risk communities. Uh, as of now, in terms of May and June, in terms of surveillance, we're also ongoing with, uh, testing of all medical personnel and pediatric uh, admissions regardless of the diagnosis. We are also testing all patients admitted in the in the medical ward uh, and patients admitted in the pediatric ward. And then patients admitted in the surgical and uh, obstetric and non-medical ward, we are screening tests for symptoms and then we test the patients regardless of the diagnosis as well. Uh, and then in terms of case management, in February, we had a creation of the isolation centers for all positive cases. And what we did in the early stages of the pandemic is that we isolated all positive cases and we, we isolated, uh, healthcare workers and trained them. So we actually had quarantine for healthcare workers and also quarantine for all positive cases. And then, uh, in, F uh, in the, in, in April, we started uh, uh, creating isolation centers throughout the country. So we started with Osaka that, uh, that had uh, isolation centers. Uh, we had the Levy Monawasa University uh, Hospital being the national isolation center. And then we scaled it up to Dollar Central Hospital, which was also an isolation center. And then with uh, Livingstone General Hospital in the southern part of the country was also identified as an isolation center. So we had Isolation centers in uh, various uh, provinces, um, and then we we started when we had so many cases in the northern part of the country. In May, we started uh, what we termed as a community mode of case management. So initially, we were isolating all positive cases, and we were quarantining them at the various isolation centers, regardless of the symptomatology. So in every positive case was isolated. Uh, together with the healthcare workers as well, and testing was done at uh, at, uh, at intervals for healthcare workers. And then when we had uh, when the scale up of uh, cases uh, came through in March, we started now having the community control. So we had such very interesting to number twenty one and twenty two institutions, which are the mandatory screening and quarantine of international travelers and restricted travel. We had additional measures of closing the the public places, uh, social amenities where uh, schools, churches, and casinos and bars were closed. So the mandatory uh, in uh, public places to use uh, social distancing, uh, hand hygiene, uh, wearing of masks in the, in the public as well. Uh, and then uh, once, because of the economic uh, impact that all this had, we had to try to think about uh, removing some of the uh, measures by reopening uh, restaurants and churches, that was late May, and then in June, we, uh, starting from the first of June, uh, schools have reopened for examination classes and final year uh, students. I should be quick, quick to mention that Zambia never went into a total lockdown. So we only had um, uh, lockdowns for uh, high risk areas for uh, weeks and days. That's to but we said for massive screen, but we never went into a total lockdown. Uh, but what we, what we looked at was actually the quarantining of all cases in the initial phases of the pandemic and quarantining of healthcare with another situation of the process cases in the initial phases of the pandemic, uh, actually helped in reducing the numbers and keeping the numbers low. But as we go with the community model, we actually expect that we are going to have the stage in the cases as we go because now, we are uh, following the, uh, the cases that are positive, but asymptomatic in the, in the community. And then we are only isolating uh, the cases that are high-risk cases with comorbidity, as it is known, and also cases that have, um, uh, that have social economic uh, implications. Uh, 
We also had a rich position of the regional partners that we used, uh, uh, that we received a lot of support from them. We had technical support from KEPFA, WHO, Africa CDC. I should speak to mention that the WHO actually did a lot of work with us in China CDC. We had community support as well from KEPFA, China, Russia, JASMA. We had World Bank from both Africa CDC and, uh, Africa Development Bank, which was like our own with us. Our friendly partners that talk in so many logistics in terms of guidelines, uh, formulation, and also in terms of uh, testing uh, logistics. Uh, in terms of the challenges, it's not been like uh, most of the other countries that we've seen. Mostly it's in terms of the personal protective equipment of healthcare access to mail, we find that there was, um, there was a, a, a large uh, knowledge gap in terms of the health uh, healthcare workers, uh, inadequate PPE. Uh, and also, um, uh, just, uh, the issues of, uh, uh, morning and doping for healthcare workers, which was also, uh, part of the challenges that sometimes they use, uh, disease and also doing something new that were not, some of the health workers are not used to. And then, of course, we had uh, operational challenges in terms of transport. Uh, also, we had very poor, uh, public sector involvement. I think this is one of our, uh, our lessons learned. And also because of the lockdowns around the around the world, we, we found that local supplies were also taking unnecessarily long in terms of uh, reaching the intended uh, uh, facilities. Also, the changing evidence has been a challenge. We find that in terms of uh, therapeutic changes, also in terms of the presentation of the disease, it also has, has been a, a huge challenge. Because right now we are now talking about the for the involved uh, presentation of COVID-19 was of course to the special symptoms that we are mostly accustomed to. So this has also posed the challenge in terms of the, the, the junior staff to pick up the cases. Um, and lacking of effective uh, therapy, of course, has been around the world. We, we are not sure of what to do at what time. Uh, infrastructure and equipment is also which, uh, has been a huge challenge. You can imagine we have a country of about 750 square inches. In thousand square edge, we have 37, uh, ICU phase. So if the pandemic was to go on in a higher stage, we might have had a huge challenge in terms of ICU, uh, uh, bed. And also an increase in the, in the turnaround time in terms of the test, an average of about 72 hours to 30 days. So, uh, tests sometimes take longer. For us to get the results, and this has, uh, has had a huge uh, impact in the response to the to the pandemic. And in terms of the case management, I think it's discussed a lot of the kind of uh, approach that we should have. And uh, one of the challenges that we've made is that some of the cadres in the in the in the system are not specialists, so we tend to rely on uh, information from uh, elsewhere. For us to, to, to have that multidisciplinary kind of uh, approach. And the stage staff as well, it's been, it's, it's been a, a, a huge uh, challenge because we had to quarantine uh, 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 staff as well. So you, you have to create a model in such a way that uh, staff should be released and then another team goes in. So we actually created three groups of uh, uh, healthcare workers at each quarantine center. So that one team is working, one team is in a uh, health isolation, the other team is resting at home, and then the paper goes like that. This was used in terms of stopping the, the, stopping the spread of the, of the, of the infection. And also, uh, as I mentioned, with the number of, uh, specialists. We, we had also high care with infections. We had about 111 that have been, uh, infected. The disease started from as, uh, as the result of, uh, gene, I think. Uh, right now, the case might have changed to a higher number. Uh, and we've uh, tried to inquire into what has caused the infection. And most, what has come out is that most of the healthcare workers are, are being infected at the time of, of doping. So uh, I'm sure there is a lot of uh, research going around and trying to see what else we can do and how we can, we can, we can perform in terms of uh, uh, orienting the staff. It's been a new disease, a lot of knowledge gaps, ever-changing clinical presentation. Most of the clinicians have expressed that uh, concern, and there's a high uh, levels of anxiety and stigma among 
that has not made us at the start of the pandemic was, was a huge challenge. But as we went to uh, on the uh, on the health care workers, this was in school. We've learned that uh, uh, we, our system has been exposed. We know that our immediate response and preparedness is also infection has been challenged. Elsewhere, everywhere around the world, this has been challenged. And it's high time to think about and to strategize how best we should have uh, approached this. There, there's been a social in terms of healthcare workers. There's been a feeling of let down. Uh, and this has been everyone in terms of inadequate PPE, oxygen delivery adjuncts. And I should mention here that we've met a lot in terms of the oxygen delivery adjuncts. And uh, we have partnered with uh, the WHO and CDC to try to scale up uh, the delivery of uh, oxygen delivery adjuncts around the country. Uh, Motivation and remuneration of healthcare workers, this has been tabled as well for healthcare workers as great concern. And really, this has shown a lot of gaps in terms of the policies and insurance and in terms of compensation of healthcare workers. The system has been, has been tested and challenged. I think it's high time we sat down and think about it and look at it in a different angle. Maybe. There's been a lot of policies in terms of HIV, TB infection, and uh, healthcare workers as well. But we didn't have any policy or any guidance in terms of infectious diseases. And of course, the system is only as good as it can, uh, as it can do what it can. So I think our system has been tested and, uh, and these have been a lot of, uh, lessons learned. So we thought about testing, decentralization of testing would have been done early. We would have involved the, uh, uh, private sector at, uh, at an early stage. And uh, we thought about involving community of workers in uh, contact tracing. This would have been essential from the start. And this has been now the focus as we go on community model uh, management of testing. Mass screening testing and any lockdown would have helped, uh, but I think this would have been better in the high risk uh, uh, community. Um, and, and yeah, that has been the Zambian experience. Uh, we call Mukwambi the only name. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I think it's always great to have perspective from the individual countries and to understand what the differences and similarities are that each country is facing as they're fighting this pandemic. 